Good introduction on Brian. As a founder of Grit.org, Brian Harbin is determined to spend the second half of his professional career dedicated to teaching life and success principles to current and future generations in order to help them become mentally, physically, and emotionally resilient for whatever life puts in their path. As a freshman at the University of Georgia, he ran his own business selling educational books door to door and spent over 10,000 hours in face-to-face -face sales and finished the number one salesperson out of over 2,600, you heard that number, his first year, his final year. He simultaneously built a multi-million dollar sales organization of 64 college students and became one of the top 10 recruiters in the history of the 140-year-old internship at that point, now 165. 10,000 units summer, number one in the world that year. Mr. Brian Harbin. All right. What I'm gonna share with you guys today is three ingredients. And these three ingredients, I feel like if you guys can really absorb these ingredients and really take them to heart, then whatever goals you currently have set, they're too small, okay? So again, with these three ingredients, if you can really bake them into your bones, then whatever goals you have set, they're currently too small, all right? So the first ingredient I wanna to talk to you guys today about is the decision. I call this one the decision. All right, so I'm gonna take you guys back to the summer of 2001. All right, so summer 2001, just finished my fourth summer. We were selling in Las Cruces, New Mexico and El Paso, Texas, if we got anybody that sold out there before. And I'd recruited an eight-person team. And on that eight-person team was my best friend, Zach. And Zach, in order to get him to come sell books that summer, we made a deal. And the deal was, is that if he came to sell books with me, the following summer, I was gonna go backpack through Europe with him. All right, so Zach comes out, sells books with me, has a great summer, top first year, 3,000 units. And actually, fast forward to today, Zach is the youngest vice president at Workday, which is a billion dollar software company. But anyway, Zach had a great summer. Uh, we come back, I graduate that January, and then that spring, I recruit a five person team. Me and Zach take them up to sales school, and then we see them off the rest of the organization. And then me and Zach get on a plane, and we go to Europe. And so for eight weeks, we backpacked through 13 countries in eight weeks, spent about 11 grand, and we just lived it up. And the plan was I was going to be, I had applied to go to MBA school at University of Georgia, and then was going to continue selling, you know, going to school, recruiting during the school year, and then coming back to sell. But I'll never forget, we're in Brussels, Belgium. And back then, you had to go to the computer lab to check your emails. We go to a computer lab, and I'd get an email from the University of Georgia saying that I'd been waitlisted, all right? So the problem I was up against is that September 11th had just happened the fall before, and so there was all these business professionals with three to five years work experience that were all going back to MBA school. And I was trying to go th straight through. So the likelihood of me getting in was pretty low. So I had a decision to make of like, okay, I can put fate in the hands of the University of Georgia, or I can take fate in my own hands. And so my other option was to go full-time at Southwestern. So really the way I looked at it was like, well, I've never really gone all in on one thing, and especially not at Southwestern, because I'd always done it part-time with school and fraternity and girlfriends and different things. So, and I said, well, I'd done pretty good up to that point, but then I, now I can really see how well I can do and, you know, I can do it for a few years, see where it takes me. So that was the decision I made right there in, in uh, Brussels, Belgium. And so me and Zach get back from Europe. We actually go sell books in Iowa for nine weeks, end up having to deliver, to deliver books in the snow, which was not ideal. And then I came to a meeting like this. And so when, G, uh, when GRS rolled around, I had one person on my team. And so the thought was, okay, if you're, if you're gonna full time, you should bring 20. And it was like, well, if you're gonna bring 20, you might as well bring 30. And nobody had really done it in a while. It had been like since the 80s, so that was kind of cool. My largest team up to that point was eight, so I didn't really know what I was doing anyway, so I was like, well, might as well. And so I was like, all right, let's do it. Let's shoot for 30. And, and back then, I don't know if this still holds true, but back then you had to get uh, 
2,000 names to bring 20. You had to get 2,000 names, and you do 20 commitments a night. All right, so I'm like, well, probably need to get 30 or 3,000 names, and I need to get about 26 commitments a night. So that's what I did. I did that for 16 to 20 weeks every Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday night. And I'll say this, too, for the three years that I was full-time at Southwestern, I got a commitment. I got 20 commitments every single Thursday night. And that was a really big deal for me because Thursday night was the one night that I had to go out and hang out with my friends because every weekend I was doing two to three parent visits, okay? And I also say this too, for the three years that I full-time, the exact number of parent visits that I did was the exact number of people that ended up coming to sales school. So very strong correlation there. So I did that for all 16 to 20 weeks and it literally came down to the very, very end. So the day we leave for sales school and it always ended up being on mother's day and we're meeting at a hotel parking lot in atlanta and my whole organization is going to be there i think we're meeting at four o'clock so i get there at 3 30 and people start showing up trickling in and in about 4 15 we've got the majority of people are there so i have jim jarman who was the aol at that time i said jim all right you take everybody up to murfreesboro i'll hang back for the stragglers and then i'll meet you guys up there tonight it's like, all right, great. So I'm sitting there in the parking lot. At the time, I had a green uh, Nissan Frontier, this dark green Nissan Frontier. I'm sitting there in my truck, and I've got a roster of everybody that's supposed to be there. And so I'm looking down the roster, and that day I was supposed to have 31 people from my own personal team that were there, and I'm looking at the roster, and I've got 29. I'm like, you got to be kidding me. All right, so I'm too short. So I look at the two people I'm missing. There's this one girl, Jessica, who I had just recruited the week before, didn't do a parent visit, and all I had was her apartment number. I call her apartment number. She didn't answer, but school was out, so the likelihood of her, you know, she was pretty much a cold lead at that point. But the other name I look at is Kurt. Now, Kurt had been with me. I'd recruited him in January. I'd probably done a dozen follow-ups with Kurt, did a parent visit with Kurt, but the catch with Kurt is he didn't have a car, all right? So I had his dorm number, and I had his mom's phone number. So I called his dorm number, no answer. I called his, mom house, his mom's house probably five or six times, ring, 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 just nothing. So at this point, it's, it's like 5.15. I'm already super late. So I look at his address, and it's 30 minutes the opposite direction of Nashville. But I'm like, well, I've come this far, so I might as well at least drive out to his house and just see if he's there, right? So that's what I do. And I never forget driving my Nissan Frontier, sweaty palms, and really the gravity of the moment was sinking in of like, I'm either gonna bring 30 or I'm not. And I'll never forget pulling up on the cul-de-sac and he's got this one story brick house. The grass is like three feet tall garage doors closed, no cars. And I'm like, well, I'm here, might as well at least get out and knock. So I get up, go up to the door, stand back, nothing. Go up, stand back, nothing. I'm like, all right, I'll just knock one more time, then I gotta hightail it out of here. So go up to the door, stand back. The door opens up, Kurt's standing in the doorway with his shirt off. And I'm like, Kurt, what's up, man? You ready to go to Nashville? He's like, yeah, I guess so. Let me get my stuff. I'm like, cool, all right, let's do this. <laughs> I'm, like, I'm like, by the way, does your mom know that you're going to be gone for the whole summer? While you're packing, I'm going to write her a note and send her some money for the, uh, for the lawn. But anyway, so, so me and Kurt, and by the way, fast forward, uh, Kurt ended up having a great summer. Ended up selling like 1,400 units, just missed the trip, but had a great summer. But me and Kurt, we're driving up to Nashville, and I got to tell you, there was, a, uh, there was an energy flowing through me like I had never experienced. And um, i never forget that Thursday night at uh, the President's Club dinner. They had me come up and speak about bringing 30 people, what it meant, and I share that same story about Kurt. And then... I remember everybody leaves, they're going off to the Roger Sype talk, and I'm over there in the corner, and really just all the emotions of, that I'd been through the previous six months of 
just the stress, the pressure, the, all the no's, the rejection, all the heartaches, all the little victories just started bubbling up on me. And I sobbed. I mean, I wept like an ugly cry. And it was one of those moments where it was like, you see people after they win the Super Bowl hoisting up that trophy, and you never really can just imagine what they're going through. But that day, I got a taste of it. I got a taste of what it felt like to go all in, to go all in on myself. Because I tell you, that decision to go all in on myself, it totally changed my life. So for the next three years, including that year, I'd recruited 60, I recruited 67 people to come sell books with me, really put myself in a really good situation financially and with experience, you know, end up meeting Jen four months later, you know, some of my best friends to this day, as she mentioned, a lot of them from our weddings. As a matter of fact, a guy from my 30 person team actually just got him a job with Zach at Workday, which was kind of cool. So, still in touch with a lot of those folks. And so, I, I stand before you today to really ask you what's the decision that you need to make? And I get it, like, not everybody needs to sell 10,000 units, not everybody needs to bring a 20 person team, but I do believe that everybody in here needs to make a decision. And you know, I can't make that decision for you. It's really something you got to look yourself in the mirror and make that decision, whatever it may be. Because if you don't make the conscious decision, whatever it may be, then subconsciously, you're going to make the decision to take the path of least resistance when things get hard. And I don't want you to do that. All right. You guys with me? All right. How are we doing so far? Are we good? All right. So that's the first ingredient, it's the decision. The second one is passion, passion. All right, so I'm gonna start this part with a question. All right, so when you guys are holding an interview or doing a notebook, what are some of the advantages that you give someone on why they should come and sell books with you? Just go ahead and write them off. What are some of the advantages? Uh, money. money. Habits. Habits. What's that? Friends. Okay, good. So when I was recruiting, the big five were like money, experience, challenge, travel, advancement. I don't know if you guys use a lot of those now. Um, and those advantages are really, really good. And again, assuming that you're going to be get, doing the phone time, the follow-ups, the parent commitments, then those advantages are definitely going to help you recruit a five or 10-person team. But if you want to recruit a 20-person team, a 30 person team, a 40 person team, then the reason for coming to work with you has to be bigger than any of those. All right, let me explain. And I'm gonna put this into a sales analogy since I know we have a lot of salespeople in here. Okay, so when you're sitting down with Miss Jones in her living room and talking about why she should buy a set of books, what are some of the reasons that you give her on why she should buy books from you? They're cool. They're cool. Yeah, exactly. So some of the big ones when I sold were like, you know, the methods of change, mom's for God, saves time, formula on two pages, right? And assuming you're putting in the 80 hours, the 180 demos, then those advantages and selling points are definitely going to help you sell 5,000 units. But if you want to sell 10,000 units, 15, 20,000 units, what are you really selling to Miss Jones? The value of education. The value of education. So it's like I was talking to Deborah, and she said, you know, Brian, I got one chance to give my kids a good education, and if there's anything I can do to help with that, I'm all for it. And she's like, well, shoot, I spent a couple hundred dollars a month on Bobby's lacrosse gear, and that's not going to help him get into college. Well, Deborah, that's why I'm here. That's what this is for. Right? Boom, summary, price build up, what everybody likes about the way I do business is I take orders today, deliver at the end of the summer. Better yet, I got them in my truck, cash them out, right? So the point there is when you're, when you're selling books to Miss Jones, you're really selling the value of education, right? If you really want to sell a lot of books, right? You don't go into spending 40 minutes of going back into the books, right? You step back and you talk about the value of education. 
All right, so let's go back to that recruiting example. Okay, so we already talked about money, experience, challenge, travel. Those are all great, but if you want to bring a 20 or 30 or 40 person team, then what are you really selling? What are you really selling? A way of life. A way of life. You see, the biggest advantage I had the year that I brought 30 was that I could look any 18, 19, 20-year-old dead in the eye and with 100% conviction tell them that the absolute best thing they could do with their summer was to come and work with me. Right? I was going to show them this way of life, this way of life of entrepreneurship, reading good books, positive self-talk, healthy habits, being around good people, uh, you know, uh, good work stats, right? And if I'm making $40,000 a summer doing it consistently, then I can at least help you make a fourth of that, right? And I would also go as far as saying this, if I was recruiting today, is that if 99% of people that sell books say it's the hardest thing they've ever done, but then 47% of them want to come back and do it again, what's that tell you? It tells you that this is life-changing. This is life-changing. Okay? All right, so we talked about passion for selling. We talked about passion for recruiting. The last passion I want to talk to you guys about is the passion for people. Okay, and really having that customer focused mindset. So that last summer, you know, my eighth summer, but most I ever sold was 8,000 units and I, I wanted to hit 10,000, but it was like kind of this mystical creature, right? And Rao was really, really big on having a customer focused mindset. So for me, that's what I was gonna focus on is like 10 customers a day, that's it. So that summer, that's what I did. Ended up, I think it was like 664 customers that summer. And I tell you, I applied that same mentality to everything else I did. So when I got into brokering domain names, so just to give you the short version of what a domain broker does, is I'm kind of like a real estate agent of domain names and websites, right? So there's a buyer, there's a seller, I bring together a deal and get a commission, okay? So when I first got into brokering domain names, that was my mentality. It's like, all right, I'm gonna get as many customers as I possibly can and just build up my customer list, right? So early on in my career, I helped a guy buy a $2,500 domain name, right? Maybe we had a couple hundred bucks commission. So a couple years later, the guy calls me up and says, Brian, I've got a domain I want you to sell. It's ice.com, and we want $3.5 million for it. So within 48 hours, I sold ice.com for full price to a billionaire, Jeff Sprecher, owns the New York Stock Exchange through text message, right? And that commission probably could have paid off our first house, right? So, but it all came from having that customer-focused mindset. Some mom that at 10 a.m. in the morning, I sell her my phone with words standing up in her doorway because she wouldn't let me in, right? Because all I wanted to do was get a customer for the day. That same mindset, right? And even a month ago, we just said, all right, we want to grow our YouTube channel. What's our focus? 10 customers a day, 10 subscribers a day, right? And so we've got a plan in place to do that. So that's what I want to talk to you guys. So again, with passion. So when you're selling books to Miss Jones, what are you really selling? The value of education. When you're recruiting, what are you really recruiting? A way of life and then a passion for people, all right? So you guys doing all right? We're doing good so far? You guys with me? All right, good deal. So, um, I didn't even tell you guys to. I'm going to give away some cash when I'm done here. You guys okay with that? You guys good? All right, good. Um, all right, so the last one I want to talk to you guys about today is purpose. Purpose. Okay. So, after I left Southwestern, I applied that way of life to everything that I did. So I ended up leaving Southwestern. I go work with a sister company at the time selling insurance. And so for the next decade after that, I built a sales organization in insurance um, of 26 agents. About half of them were people that I'd worked with selling books. Um, and it still pays me a lot of renewals today. Um, I applied it to my marriage with Jen, which we're coming up on 17 years. Applied it to raising three boys. Um, applied it to now coaching over 36 seasons of sports, 
you know, apply that same way of life to, you know, building a domain brokerage. And, but I always knew that my life was pointing me towards something bigger. And there was one mentor um, that, I, that I always had that, um, and it was my granddad. And unfortunately, we buried my granddad about a week and a half ago. But, uh, and my granddad, his name was Papa, and um, back in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, he built a super successful baking company, one of the largest privately held baking companies in the world. Or you can still buy the pies in the grocery store, Edwards Pies. That was my, my granddad. But um, very spiritual, very wise, and, but more importantly, he was my granddad, and he knew everything about me. And we would have these super deep conversations about you know, what I wanted to do, my purpose, and, and how I was going to make a difference in the world. And, and so one day we're talking, and he just stops me, and he said, Brian, he's like, everything you're talking about, these are all principles. These are all principles. And for me, it was really that aha moment of like, okay, that's it. This is the product, okay? So once I'd figured out the product, what was the next ingredient I needed? We talked about it earlier. What's the first ingredient I needed? I need to make a decision, right? Because at this point, I needed to exit my insurance you know, business that I was in. I had just turned 40, and the year of 2020 was around the corner. So the way I looked at it was like, okay, well, if I just turned 40, I got another 40 years to pump all my passion into this. The year of 2020, I loved because it's like it's easy to remember, 2020 vision. I could already picture the established 2020. Um, and, you know, domain brokering was doing great. It was going to be able to support everything we wanted to do. So that's what we did. We set a date for January 1, 2020. We're launching this thing, grit.org. Already had the name, the domain, all that stuff. Well, we all know what happened three months later, right? We get hit with a global pandemic. And there was definitely points along the way where we're like, is this really going to happen? But it was almost like rising out of the ashes of this global pandemic was grit.org. You guys, you have any uh, Game of Thrones fans in here? All right, so you remember when they burned down the Targaryen queen's castle and she rises out of the ashes and you see the three dragon eggs, right? That was kind of like us. I love that analogy too because I always call Jen my Targaryen queen with our three fire-breathing dragons, which are our boys. Um, so that's especially meaningful to me. But the reason I knew we were going to survive is not because we're special, but because we were based on these principles, these time-tested life and success principles. And I'm going to run through them real quick. You don't have to write them down. They're all at gritcreed.com, gritcreed.com. But as I go through and share these principles, you guys are all probably going to smile, right, because they're going to look pretty familiar to you. And it's not limited to selling books. It's not limited to anything that I'm doing. But it's I am someday going to be what I'm now becoming. I don't find an excuse, I find a way. I am not a problem spotter, I am a problem solver. I speak to encourage not only myself, but also others. I can, I will, I'm going to, is my mantra in the face of adversity. I will follow through with what I say I will do. I will try and try and try again. I will never ask someone to do something I'm not willing to do. I am cool, calm, collected. I am mentally, physically, and emotionally resilient. I will accept the things I cannot change. I will have the courage to change the things I can. And I will seek the wisdom to know the difference. And lastly, I will lead by example because my purpose is larger than me. And that's it. That's what we're based on. And, and once we kind of established that, it was like, okay, we'll figure out how to make money off. We're entrepreneurs, right? So... Really, the mentality behind it was, okay, we have these principles. And the way I looked at it was like, okay, if I learn all these principles at 18 years old or started learning at 18 years old, and it put me years and years ahead of everybody else my age, imagine if I learned those principles even younger. So that's what we do. So we start teaching these principles at age six, right? So we have a summer sports camp for kids age six to 12, Basically building mental, physical, and emotional resilience through field sports, court sports, calisthenics. We have a high school counselor training program. We have professional coaches, athletes, entrepreneurs, Olympians come and talk to the kids about how to build more grit. 
And because we had access to all these amazing speakers, we turned it into a podcast. So now we distribute that out, just motivational content. And, you know, we have a mental performance coaching program for young athletes. And so the reason I share all that and kind of the way I see it is we're basically building a farm team for future top first years. So hopefully it makes y'all's job a lot easier as you start to recruit more people. Is that, would that be nice to have, right? Um, but the reason I share all that is here I am, here we are 17 years removed from what you guys are doing. And we're still living, breathing, and teaching these same principles, all right? So I want you guys to remember that about purpose is that is really tied around these principles and what you're helping instill through this way of life with people. All right, good. So let's do this. Let's go ahead and give away some, uh, some money. And then what I want you to do is you come up, tell us your name, your goal in terms of production and how many people you want to recruit. And then when you're done with that, you're going to say, I'm all in. All right, but don't sell me on it. You got to sell them. All right, and then I'll give you some cash. How about that? My name is Ray Petrosky, and my goal is to sell 10,000 units and recruit a 25 person team because I'm all in. My name is Anna Kolarski, and this year I'm going to sell 10,000 units and I'm going to bring out a 30 person team because someone has to break some belief barriers. So I'm all in. I love it. My name is Vivi Wynn. My goal is to sell 10,000 units and recruit a 22 plus team, and I'm all in. All right, congrats, thank you. Yeah. My name is Boston Lorenz. My goal is to hit double growth, so 5,200 units. And my goal is to recruit a 20 plus person team because I believe in the process. I believe in Southwestern, so I'm all in. I love it, thanks man, appreciate you. Uh, my name is Benjamin Grindstaff. My goal this year is to sell 10,000 units. I'm also going to recruit a 20 plus person team because I'm all in. Thanks, all right, you guys can have a seat. Um, I used to always made it a tradition to walk down that wall of greats, uh, see all the people that had brought 20. And I remember the guy, Rusty, uh, Rusty Branch, um, had been the last person to bring a 30 person team. And I remember walking down the hallway and looking at him, looking at his picture, obviously, but not him, but looking in his eyes and saying, look, if you can do it, I can do it. And when I'm saying that, I can also see my own reflection from the frame. So I really encourage you guys, look, you guys heard me today. If I can do it, you can do it, all right? And I wanna hear you guys really just make that part of your self-talk. Look. If this guy can do it, I've seen him, right? He's nothing special. If he can do it, I can do it, all right? And I love what she said about it's just time to break those belief barriers, all right? So in, in closing, what we're going to do, I'll take this off. We're going to end today the same way we start boot camp every single day, all right? So you guys feel free to, uh, to stand up, all right? Let's do the last part. I'm someday going to be. I'm someday going to be. Three, three.